Hello again, folks. Now, um, today, you know, we started talking about the Scott Davis case yesterday, uh, the David Coffin case out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Fulton County, Georgia. And I wanted to talk to you guys this morning about some inconsistencies with Megan Lee. Uh, now, Bruton, she, okay, <laughs> really quick, just a little background uh, on the name change from Lee to Davis to Bruton. Megan Lee, uh, within the year after David Coffin's death, moved to Australia. Yeah, because that's not fucking suspicious as shit. She moved to Australia and she found some poor Aussie to marry her. And I don't think he fully understands what happened there. Um, now, Megan was pretty much the prosecution's entire case. She was the one who provided all the evidence Primarily because they didn't have any fucking physical evidence at all. Uh, in the intervening 10 years from the time of the murder to the time that, that Scott Davis was charged and convicted, all of the evidence, all of the physical evidence had magically disappeared. All of it. Every fucking shred of it. What the fuck? In fact, the burned Porsche had fingerprints on it had latent finger marks on it and somehow these just disappeared what the fuck but so all of the prosecution's case came from megan and the funny thing that i find that you know megan has exhibited some really fucked up behavior during the course of this whole thing uh first and foremost is her email correspondence with scott huff scott huff is a crime blogger and he uh, wrote quite a few blog posts, uh, articles regarding the Scott Davis case. By the way, Alma, here you go, sweetie. Um, <laughs> so uh, she started this email correspondence with Scott Huff, and in his comment section on his articles, she would go in and post anonymously with like seven different aliases and basically started this this internet campaign to portray Scott Davis as this evil, and I'm, that's her word, this evil thing, this monster. And the funny thing about that is, is that she admitted in an email to Huff that she was trying to influence the jury on the off chance that any of them uh, went against court orders and started reading stuff online about the case, she wanted to influence them. Is it just me or does that sound like something that would constitute a mistrial? Then, on top of that, okay, so she posted 57 times throughout the course of this blog. And um, the, the thing that, that gets me about all of that, kids, is that she also was ordered during the, the course of her testimony in the trial. She was on the stand for like three or four days. Every time they'd recess, she was told not to discuss the case at all during the course of her, uh, of her testimony. And yet... Every fucking time she would email Huff about what went on in court that day. Does that not sound like a mistrialable offense to you? Because it does to me. And it would to most of the fucking legal community. Then, here's the thing, kids, is Megan testified on the stand that Scott told her that David had been shot, when in reality, Scott has said that Megan told him that... Scott was shot. Here's the thing though, kids, because it sounds like he said, she said, and it's like, okay, well, whose word do we take here? You don't have to take either of their words. You can take the word of Megan's friend, Jen Johnson. Jen Johnson actually has stated that number one, Megan called her first on the night of the murder, on the night of the fire, because to be quite honest, how can we even tell when he died? 
You can't. You can't establish a TOD with a burned corpse. But, um, Megan called Jen Johnson at 12 a.m. on December 11th of 1996. She called him, uh, Jen and stated to Jen Johnson that um, Coffin had been shot in the head and that the house was on fire. And this is actually corroborated by a note written by Jen Johnson's husband's mother who had notated the time of the call and all that other stuff. Mike Johnson actually uh, heard most of that, that call. Now, According to Megan and Scott's call records, Megan called Scott at 12.18 a.m. So almost 20 minutes had elapsed from the time that she called Jen Johnson. And Craig Foster, who was a friend of, of Coffin's, and Patricia Flavin, who was a neighbor of Coffin's, uh, overheard Megan tell Scott David's dead he's been shot they both overheard this this is a friend of the deceased and a neighbor of the deceased who both heard Megan say to Scott David's dead he's been shot this is while the house is still on fire nobody knew how Scott or I'm sorry how David had died until well after these phone conversations and Megan is the only person who has ever said that Scott is the one who said that David's been shot meanwhile we've got not one not two but four fucking witnesses that can testify and did that Megan is the one who said first that David had been shot Qua? the fuck and yet the prosecution chose to ignore this each time that she said that david had been shot she was asked either by jen johnson or by patricia flavin how do you know that how do you know that he was shot and she conveniently did just didn't answer the question she just didn't say anything and none of you motherfuckers find this suspicious um now at the time that Megan called Scott, Scott was, had uh, his friend Greg Gatley and Atlantic Police Department Officer O'Connor at his house because he had been attacked that night as well. And both of them were standing next to Scott when he was speaking with Megan. Neither of him said, uh, neither of them heard him say that David had been shot. Now, here's the thing, kids. The reason why that's important is because. Megan testified that that was when Scott had told her that David had been shot. Two witnesses, one a police officer, both testified that Scott never said any such thing while he was on the phone with Megan. Now, and here's the thing though, kids, is you have to remember that every time that the prosecution has, has pointed out that Scott said that David was shot. He always said shot. He never, ever, not once said shot in the head. There is only one person that ever in this case said the words shot in the head. And that's Megan. And again, later the coroner did discover that yes, he had in fact been shot in the head. If only one person said ever that he was shot in the head before the authorities knew it. That's the person you look at. Hello? Now, in a December 21st conversation with Jen Johnson, Jen asked Megan uh, how she knew that Coffin had been shot in the head. And Megan replied, and I quote, Did I say that? I must have told Scott that too. What the fuck kind of thing is that to say? Think of the context of that conversation, kids. Really think about it. That sounds an awful lot like shit. 
Did I tell Scott that he was shot in the head or did I just say that he'd been shot? Fuck. Uh, and the funny thing is, is that later when she was questioned about this, she blamed it on a Valium that she had taken that night. What? How do you blame knowledge of a fucking murder, details of a murder, that nobody else could have possibly known at the time on a Valium? Valium is for anti-anxiety, sweetheart. It's not for omnipotence. <laughs> now, here's the funny thing. The only time that she ever claimed that Scott had told her that David had been shot was after the first $100,000 reward had been offered. She suddenly remembered it. All of a sudden, a year later. Ay. Now... The thing is, is that Megan is known to be a bit of a liar. A bit. <laughs> uh, she's known to be extremely manipulative and she's known to falsify information. One of these incidences is the fact that she flunked out of the University of Georgia. She flunked out. She never told her parents that she flunked out, but she did continue the ruse of going to school all the way through graduation and, con and continue to accept tuition money from her parents. That's called fraud. <laughs> the fuck is this shit? And she was never charged. Her parents never swore out charges. P quite personally, my daughter fucking lies to me like that. She can either pay me back the money or I'm swearing out fucking charges. Um, and then, and what really gets me is she tried to bring Scott in to her bullshit by begging him pretty much her, their entire marriage to fake a diploma for her. <laughs> um, and then on top of that as if that wasn't enough the entire time she's married to Scott she maintained a sexual relationship with her ex-boyfriend a doctor and she also maintained a relationship with a 50 year old billionaire from New York and she went to see these people in New York the weekend of her wedding anniversary oh my god she had also often said to friends that she wanted to be a kept woman do you know what a kept woman is kids a kept woman is somebody who she's basically a prostitute she exchanges money for sex only it's not just a hundred dollars five hundred dollars it's her entire life they pay her her rent and her bills and give her spending money it's her income in exchange for a sexual relationship and she had said many times that that's what she wanted to be so at the time of the murder, she was screwing Coffin, she was screwing this doctor, uh, ex-boyfriend of hers, and she was screwing a 50-year-old billionaire from New York. Coffin had recently made a date with another woman around the time of his murder. Does that not sound like fucking motive? That's motive, kids. For fuck's sake. <laughs> Now, I am going to leave a link uh, to a page on this free Scott Davis website, which has all the corroborating evidence. There's documents and all kinds of shit that you can look through here that corroborate everything that I've just stated in this video. So I'm going to leave that link down below. Don't forget to subscribe to me here on YouTube. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Mama Phoenix 6 And if you go on over to the About page here on my channel, you'll find everything from my blog to my Pinterest boards to my Facebook fan page. Thank you all very much for watching. See you soon.